In this episode, V. La Bianca teaches how to kick apologetics butt for breakfast and all for self-care. My guest for the special intermission interview is Off the Leash. Sherman the Dog from Adventures and Odyssey joins the show to explain why he ran away. In recent news, Joyce Meyer promises that anybody who gives a podcast review will receive a sevenfold in return. Five stars. Don't deconstruct alone. Join the Life After Secret community on Facebook. The show depends on fans like you. Please give monthly contributions on Patreon. Want to show your support for the show but might be a cheapskate? Give a rating review on iTunes. This is the voice of Brady Harden, and I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Life After Podcast. Recently, I was thinking, what is the purpose of the podcast? I was able to boil it down to three things. Help people deconstruct their faith, discover who they are, and reimagine their future. I'm not here to try to sell you any version of God or belief system, but to give you the tools that you may need to get out of Christian fundamentalism or other harmful religion. So for each episode, I'm trying to find the things that would have best helped me when I was deconstructing that I can provide now. One of those is a conversation with my guest today, V. La Bianca. They're non-binary and use they, them pronouns. They are a former evangelical conservative Christian turned progressive atheist activist. I say that three times fast. And value skepticism and humanism above all else. They host an independent call-in show, Skeptic Generation, every Sunday, second Saturday morning, 11.30 a.m. Central. You can find them most easily on Twitter at Author Confusion. They're so good at being able to combat Christian fundamentalist arguments. The purpose of this episode isn't to learn how to argue well or how to do counter apologetics, but to internalize the lessons and realize that this is mental health. When we're able to add reason as we're getting out of indoctrination and to grow our immunity against gullibility, having reason is mental health. Not only does reason help us from keeping bad ideas out of our minds, It also helps us know what we can do for the ideas that get stuck, the ones that repeat, those old tapes that keep repeating over and over. Reason allows us to see that we're not alone. It helps us to put things in the right proportion and helps us to find solutions instead of just freaking out about the problem. I truly believe that this is an extremely important episode and I hope that it's as valuable to you as it was to me. This is my conversation with V. La Bianca. B, this is a life after. We are so glad that you're here. How are you? I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, Where are you calling from? I am in Austin, Texas. Hey, keep it weird. (laughs) Absolutely. Move from (laughs) Portland, who is keeping it weird. Austin who keeps it weird in a whole different way so one of my favorite friends with benefits is from Austin so shout out to that city wonderful you make beautiful gay men and I appreciate that and all of my knowledge about Portland comes from Portlandia but yeah you don't say that around Portland people (laughs) yeah 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 I will not and if you're from Portland you didn't hear that so there's not even a little bit you're like a fucking Yoda online uh, and doing these amazing explanations of logical arguments of how to push back against bullshit Bible fundamentalist. Can you give a little explanation about what? Absolutely. You do, so I, I guess you call me a content creator. Uh, I feel like that is a very broad category that doesn't tell you very much, <laughs> while also tell like pigeonholing you in a very cringy category. <laughs> so. Technically, that's Mm -hmm. what I do. And I do have two main methods of that. So on the one hand, uh, Brady, probably what you've interacted with most is the Twitter side of things um, where I'll I'll just kind of, you know, wax philosophical about stuff in 280 characters. Um, But the other thing that I do is I host a live call-in show on YouTube every Sunday um, called Skeptic Generation. 
And I do this with my partner in crime and also in real life. His name is Eric. And we encourage people to call into the show and tell us what they believe and why they believe it. Uh, and it could span, it runs the gamut, right? It can be about like God beliefs or religious beliefs. It can also be anything that kind of has this, this kind of cultural weight behind it is a ripe topic for us. So people call in and we have a 10, 20 minute conversation about it. What inspired you to start doing that? What's the origin story? You fell into a well and bats ran at you and you realized that you can use this horrible experience for good. Uh, that's that's about that it. That's, that's it, you? Brady. <laughs> it was the well and the bats. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was a very conservative Christian growing up. I went to a Christian university uh, for undergrad and began to kind of ask questions, uh, have a have have these conversations that I wasn't allowed to in a very restrictive household growing up that were starting to open my mind to you know other possibilities, uh, some problems, obviously with the worldview that I had been brought up in. Around the time that I moved to Portland to go to grad school, I started really diving into this deconstruction. And at that time, I was already a very progressive Christian, you know, that that pipeline from, oh, I'm, I'm just a, like a progressive Christian into like, oh, no, I'm actually I'm a wit and <laughs> I do Wicca. And then now I'm an atheist. And that was kind of my my journey as well. Um, but I found online a lot of atheist content creators who had similar formats, who would talk to people and break down a lot of these arguments I had been taught were slam dunks, right? <laughs> so growing up, I was like, oh, nobody's going to know what hit them. You're going to win the argument. It's going to be great. Proves God exists. Awesome. And then I watched people actually, even both everyday people like me and apologists just get demolished essentially. So it really was fundamental in me watching and consuming this content. Fast forward a couple of years, I met up with a bunch of people who had been inspirational to me at the American Atheist Convention in, in um, Cincinnati, that was in 2019, um, and I actually met my partner, Eric, there. He gave me his business card and he was like, hey, if you're ever interested in coming down to Austin and joining the team, show up. So I ended up taking him up on it. I'd never been to Austin before. I packed a single bag and put all my stuff in a moving truck and just kind of wandered down here. Yeah, it's it's just been something that is so impactful in my life in the most strange and unexpected way. I was never an in front of the camera person ever. Talk to me any other year of my life and I would have physically died at the idea of having to sit in front of a, a live studio audience or uh, multiple thousands of people watching me live just like yeah, something just clicked. I think I felt right. I think I felt supported and in a community that cared. And I felt like I had something important to say. I love when we're able to take those old experiences and turn them into something different. I remember apologetics wasn't a thing that I was interested in, but I always thought of as the adult in the room. Mm. I thought of that. It was kind of this really strong base thing. I don't need to really worry about it. It's kind of like in a show where they have some weird science fiction magic thing happening and they're like, I don't really need to know how that works, so I'm not going to get into it. We're just going to keep on going with the story. That was kind of my approach to it. When I started to deconstruct more publicly, it felt like I had to have all of my ducks in a row. I had to have every single ideological argument ready at command. It reminded me of that stupid verse, always uh, having an answer for the blah, 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 yep. you know, it, it felt like that. And you had to do it the moment you started to question enough to say, hey, I'm deconstructing. I really like the way you put that as apologetics, kind of being the adult in the room that you didn't really need to like, you didn't need to manage it. You didn't need to pay attention to it. It was there. Everything was fine. Um, if something bad happened, it would deal with it. Uh, like that Muppet does... Babies. Yes. Like we don't need to look up and see her face. We just need to know that those legs are there. That's all we needed to see, right? <laughs> I love that. Exactly. My dad, and oh my God, what a story that that is that we're not going into right now. He was a um, self-ordained oh, no. pastor. Oh, no. Who ran a home church that very quickly oh, no. became rather cultish. Oh, no. Um, 
<laughs> so it's just like a steady spiral of this. This gets worse. worse. Um, but, it's like a color guard of red flags. Yes, <laughs> just the whole time. Just it was bad. He was very much in the in the early early YouTube MySpace world of arguing on behalf of Christianity. So he would get into these like long like comment thread kind of arguments with people. And he was actually interacting on the other side of things from what I am doing now. And it's very weird to think about that. That was kind of his, his world. He was very focused on defending the gospel, on defending his faith. So I was actually taught quite a few, not formal apologetics, but you know, we would watch documentaries about creationism, you know, to make sure that we knew what was right and what was accurate. And we would have mock trials where we were standing in front of the throne of God and we had to defend our faith to God. And if we didn't do it accurately, we'd go behind the couch, okay, get thrown in hell. Like um, <laughs> we had to play act that the government was coming to behead us all. Wow. And we, oh my God. Yeah. So like we were that like stuff. pretty well drilled in, not again, <sighs> formal ph philosophical apologetics, but the defend at all costs bit. Yeah. You hear of those sort of drills happening at like church camps or something, but you had it at home. Yep. What the hell, V? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it was. I, I know that just growing up with brothers and now that I'm not around them, I can at times feel myself being really tense and I have to remind myself, oh yeah, they can't just come up from behind me. Um, and I'm. I'm 35 years old and I'm still like working through these weird tints, like complex PTSD. But oh my God, you had that at home with your parents. Mind blowing. Let's just say I don't resonate at all with like the traditional childhood picture. Same. Like, mm -hmm. It's just like, oh, that sounds like a nice fantasy that is completely made up and not actually a thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, you were living but, a, yeah. a Christian kick-ass I don't, I don't even ever think I've seen this movie, Gosh. but there's a movie Kick-Ass with Nick Cage and he like trained his daughter to always be alert and always be like a super, like ready to like kick somebody's butt. Oh my goodness. And she, they became like a super, that's what this sounds like is that your dad was trying to train uh, yep. you all to become little mm -hmm. like the Incredibles, but <laughs> for really pathetic arguments online. That's amazing. That is exactly what that is. The, the weird thing is, though, that it extended beyond just the concept of our individual faiths. Like, he was convinced that the world was going to end tomorrow. Yeah, like, stuff, yeah, every yeah. single day, it was like, tomorrow, everything's just going to blow up. We had uh, preppers mm -hmm. show up. I didn't know who they were. They showed up. They walked us through our own basement. And we're like, the, those guitar cases, you can hide your machine guns in there. And when everyone comes and like the bombs fall, you can hide under here. And so like they prepped out our entire basement because my dad was convinced that the end of the world was literally like next week. I guess you could say apologetics came at you in one way or another. A little bit, my a God. little bit. I mean, definitely an unorthodox version, but yeah. All sincerity, I, I hate that you had to go through that. And that shapes us that... I had a few rapture anxiety attacks yes. and yes. Um, I understand my neurodiversity better now and it can look back at things and, and understand where they came from and how my brain was framing that because I was wearing the augmented reality goggles of fundamentalism. But looking back, hindsight's 2020. Yeah, I was having a weird anxiety attack and all had to do with rapture stuff. And that messed with me. And because my brain recycles and it replays and it replays and replays, it loops, it loops, it loops. Certain memories get stuck in that track and they become a much bigger resounding mm -hmm. thing than they really need to be. Can't yeah. imagine what that would have been like in those situations of just even while you're sleeping, knowing, yeah, the thief can come in the middle of the night, but your goddamn parents too are just one room over. Yeah, it's it's been... It it, it, it was definitely weird. It's been a journey in my own understanding of my neurodiversity to be like, okay, what is me and what has been given to me? Parsing that out is interesting. Like definitely rapture anxiety. I, I feel deeply that was same uh, 100%. I, I still have like separation anxiety because there's this weird overarching thing where like, I'm, I might never see them mm -hmm. again. 
you know, like they might disappear and, you know, I, I won't have told them how I felt or whatever. Like every time could be the last time. Yes, exactly. Or the other day, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I was feeling really anxious all week and I was walking around and I felt guilty. And it was this very particular feeling of like gut wrenching guilt that I had as a kid um, because I also grew up in a very like legalistic kind of parenting where like everything you did was bad. You had to do things very specifically or else you were going to get punished. So I, wow. I walked around with a lot of guilt as a kid. And I was like, why am I feeling guilty? Like I haven't done anything wrong. Like, and then it, it like just flipped in my brain. I was like, oh, this is anxiety. I wasn't a guilty kid. Mm. I was a fucking anxious kid. Yes. <laughs> like just mind blowing. When I look back at a relationship that we had with God or how God is answering our prayers or what does God want? What are his desires? What is he convicting us of? Blah, blah, blah. I'm just trying to read the Holy Spirit, quote unquote. Mm. It's the same relationship that a fortune teller has with a crystal ball. It's just trying to project something and then read it. But when we internalize that, especially us who are neurodivergent, our brains are going on a different program than other people's. Yeah. There's no telling what kind of things we're telling ourselves and what's yeah. and what's just running its own fucking gambit, right? Um, we have to learn how to combat that and how to outsmart it. Um, that's what evolution is. We get into a new environment, we figure it out, decode what's ailing us, and we figure out ways to make it better. What do you call what you do counter apologetics? What do you what do you call it? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't call it counter apologetics necessarily. I think that's a subcategory. So, like, depending on who calls in, I might engage in counter apologetics. So, for example, I have a very dear Christian friend. Dean and he loves the Kalam cosmological argument. Like that is his thing. He will bring it to every conversation. And I think it's a dumb argument. I just think it's stupid. So we'll have this conversation between the two of us. And that is counter apologetics, what I'm doing there, because I'm countering specifically an apologetic. Okay, okay. That is only a part of what the show is and only a part of what I do. I really think my focus is on the deconstruction process much more. And while counter apologetics can help that along, like if you think in terms of philosophy and argumentation and you get counter apologetics kind of embedded into your brain, like you were saying, and, and that becomes a way to deconstruct things, that's great. That's a tool to use. But the goal is not counter apologetics, right? The goal is to deconstruct previous assumptions if they are not accurate. And to give people the tools to say, I don't need to deconstruct for you, or I don't need to rebuild this other belief system. Here are the tools that you can use to right. at least wipe out the shitty arguments. And then you can find your own that are based on what's real. Mm -hmm. I look at you and I see inside out, even like the background stuff that you use, it looks like this void behind you, but you <laughs> represent living inside of our brain. And when these stupid arguments come up, you just kind of hit them back. Like, nope, 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 <laughs> nope, nope, nope. And I, so I kind of like, I want to put you in my head with inside out, um, you know, next <laughs> to discuss or whatever you you could be logic, I guess. Right. I love it. Uh, and so when you're kind of having these arguments with people, it represents how we can use these same skills to help our mental health to make mm -hmm. sure that we're not being constantly doing that. What if, what if I'm wrong? Uh, oh my God. What if they're right about all of this? And uh, be, because if you understood the arguments that they're staying on, it's so silly yeah. and we can learn from that Perfect. right now. I want to touch on boundary making. How do you communicate to a troll or a listener or a family member or a stupid memory that you had, or a Ken Ham book, or whatever. What are the boundaries that you make, and how have you learned how to enforce those in a way that gets the point across? And if you are an asshole and while doing it, then honestly, so be it. <laughs> That's a good question. And I think that there is a, an initial boundary making phase that happens, especially if you come out of conservative Christianity or any kind of fundamentalist kind of groupthink religion. And especially if you come out of it having been raised as a girl, there is a lot of initial boundary making that you need to come up with on your own. And those boundaries are going to be extremely rigid. 
and they're going, you're going to have an extremely short like number of things that are acceptable and everything else gets no, like Mm -hmm. blown out of the water, not acceptable. And that's an important phase. And I think that I went through that phase a couple of years ago as I was starting to, you know, go through this process myself and start healing. And I found that on the other side of that, I can have different sets of boundaries for different groups of people. So for example, a troll or somebody online who just says something gross or irksome, um, I don't have much, you know, leeway there. Like if you cross over, if you you know, say something obnoxious or disrespectful, or, you know, are very clearly interacting in a dishonest way, I'm going to shut that down. And that's just going to be it. Um, You might get back on the show. You might not. Um, With people who are uh, people who watch the show and really enjoy it and get stuff out of it, but maybe are off base, um, there's a little bit more leeway there, right? I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I know that you've invested time into this. I know that you want to have this conversation um, let's see if we can come to some kind of common ground. If it becomes clear that that can't happen, then we're going to go our separate ways. And then I think the biggest, the biggest category there is like friends and family, people in my real life, where are those boundaries being set? And that's kind of where I'm still working right now. I think I've got the other two pretty much down, but this third category of people who I really care about and who really care about me, you know, what are the boundaries that I set? Are they, are they consistent? Are they, you know, this, this, this far apart for one person and then much closer for somebody else. Um, And it really does depend on a cost benefit analysis all the time. And that's the exhausting part of being around somebody who pushes your boundaries because you're not just dealing with them. You're also running this cost benefit analysis in your own brain the entire time. Like, okay, well, I could say this thing that I really feel, But then this would happen and that would be worse than just dealing with it. So I'm just going to deal with it and then not have this other bad thing happen until something does happen where it's like, no, actually, the blowout is less terrible than how you are making me feel or the thing that you are running with and saying here. So it does. It's just like it's exhausting. And I totally get that. But it really is necessary to start testing those boundaries for yourself to see who gets in and, and how they get in. There's a format that you kind of mentioned of setting those boundaries toward the beginning. If you get closer, if you cross this, here are the bound. This is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what you're saying of trying to do that cost analysis is put into what are those consequences? Who's going to get those? And it's going to be different for each person, but Mm -hmm. the same structure needs to stay. You communicate, which requires us to have self-awareness, right? We're self-aware of what crosses or what is, what do we consider unhealthy or harmful? Have that self-awareness, be able to communicate it, and then to have that backbone, which is going to develop as we grow. I've been doing this with with my family. I guess since I've come out, I don't have a relationship with my dad. And then recently there's been some situations involving my mom, uh, but they also have to do with the safety of my kid. And as a father, you know, I've got a weird unicorn, queer, single dad uh, experience, but as a father, that's my number one. Mm -hmm. And that becomes my problem. Prime directive um, yeah. informed so much of my boundary making, but then other people who don't have a kid, it's not always as black and white. Yeah, um, I think there's that. That is so important to bring up too, though, uh, Brady. Like you, you, you are mentioning. I have boundaries because I have a clear, valued thing that I am protecting and being like being cautious of. And I think a lot of the time, and this was me up until a while ago, um, the boundaries were placed not because I knew it was right, but because I was scared of what could happen, right? And so I would place a boundary because it made me feel uncomfortable or because I didn't want to think about that thing or, you know, because maybe that was a conversation I wasn't ready to have. And all of those are valid. But when you are building those boundaries for yourself and if you want them to be healthy, you have to start from a place of, okay, what is good? You know, what, what am I protecting? What am I valuing? And then the boundaries kind of fall into place because you're like, oh, anything that, that deviates from that, right? Anything that infringes upon this, that is, that is my boundary. And it's, it's focused on what is good as opposed to what is uncomfortable, if that makes sense. It makes complete sense. 
I notice that when I'm being protective of my kid, I also have to learn to be protective of my inner child. If I want to use that language, if that's something yes. that's helpful for you or another way of saying of like your own self of, of who you are deep down. Um, because if we don't give that person inside of us room to grow, we're going to stay stunted there. There's going to be a rest of development. I was shocked when I realized that most apologetics has a little or nothing to do with anything distinctively God or mm -hmm. distinctively from the Bible. When we get back from the break, I want to start picking some of these things apart and touching on... I want you to give us some boot camp, I guess. Is that, <laughs> okay. do you mind doing that of just Absolutely. kind of educating us on how we can kind of kick some apologetics ass in our own minds and online if we ever choose to do that? <laughs> that sounds great. We'll be right back right after this. Life after special intermission interview. Thanks a lot, Cordy. Who's our special guest today? This is Sherman the dog from Adventures in Odyssey. He recently ran away from Wits End and would like to share his story. Wow, you've been a busy dog. It says here that since you've left Wits End, you learned how to talk to humans using buttons. Oh, excuse me, and you're very proud that you can open doors. Can you tell us what happened to make you want to run away? Mr. Whitaker said Jesus is good boy, but Jesus never rings treats. Where is Jesus? Where is treats? Bad Jesus, bad. Wow, that sounds rough. What helpful things have you found since going on your reverse homeward bound? Join the lie after secret community. Give money on Patreon. Give five hours on iTunes. That's great advice, Sherman. Thank you. Sherman, smell cat. Where is cat? Oh yeah, I've got cats, Lincoln Salem, but they're in the other room. Give Sherman cat. No, my cats are fine. They'll stay in the other room. Give Sherman cat. Now, penis breath. Oh. No, too far. I'm offended you packed that button. You better backspace. <laughs> no, d Sherman, do not open that door. Sherman? <laughs> Well, boys, you did what you had to. I'm really proud of you. Cordy, where can I buy a shovel? And now back to this episode of the Life After's main interview. At the beginning, I said knowing better. I like to call it knowing better. That's what I'm calling this episode. I already know it because it's like, hey, we now know better, but now we know better. <laughs> Anyway, but no, that is mental health to be able to get these arguments out of our head. Before I said that, I was shocked when I realized that apologetics really has little to nothing to do with God himself, with the distinctiveness mm -hmm. of God and his actions. This is a dumb question, but what did I, what did I mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> that might be my favorite interview question ever. I love that. Um, so when you dive into apologetics, you find two things. The first thing, if you go from a historical standpoint and an understanding of the origins of these, you'll find they're not in the Bible. You'll find there is no biblical basis for these necessarily. What they are, are the first kind of cognitive steps towards defending a God belief done by church fathers, uh, usually, you know, Middle Ages time period. Um, so, for example, right, we, we have a lot of arguments that stem from the ontological argument. Uh, there's a whole group of them now, and they kind of all sound similar. And the reason for that is because they all kind of trace back to St. Anselm, who created the first version of the ontological argument, or at least the first kind of codified version of it. And St. Anselm, yeah. So the ontological argument is essentially things that exist are better than things that don't exist. And if God is the best thing that there ever was, that by definition means that he must exist because to <laughs> exist is better than to not exist. And it's, yeah, like when you get down to brass tacks, it's kind of really silly to, to, to draw it apart and be like, oh, that's what you're saying? Wait, what? 
Um, and there are so many things wrong with that, right? But there's another example of that that I think is a little simpler. I remember C.S. Lewis said about because we long for heaven, that means that there is a heaven. Yes. Yeah. And it's a when, very similar thought pattern. When I thought about it, I'm like, no, that's just circular reasoning. You're just drawing a loop there. Um, it's the same in unhealthy relationship with logic. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, at the time, that was as advanced as they really were in this whole logical structure, right? So like they were, they were starting out and like coming up with these out of nothing, right? Like these were the first arguments that were being constructed in, in this way, not necessarily Anselm, but that whole time period, it makes sense that it would be kind of rudimentary and kind of basic and that looking at it too long would kind of, you know, eh, maybe it's not so, so great. Um, and the modern apologists build off of it, but they, they, they try their best to kind of wriggle out of the problems by wording things differently without realizing that the issue is really classifying things by existence and assuming that things exist because we can conceive of them. And I want to juxtapose that between what I was being taught in theology. Yeah. As somebody who took the Bible literally, I don't even have to go by my, ex I don't even have to go by that example. Let's just talk about what we're saying about in church, about how God is mighty. He's perfect. He does all things. He answers prayers. He's miraculous. He's doing these wonderful things through people. There's these tongues of fires. There's healings. There are people being raised from the we would sing and we would talk about those. We would accredit the emotions and mm -hmm. the support and the, and the credibility. We would give those up to, to God and appropriate. He would be appropriating kind of our, our energy and our essence. And so as a theologian, we're talking all of that up. I look at that as if we're looking at a departments within a company, we were the advertisers, we're the marketers, mm -hmm. but now, oh crap, these people started deconstructing. They're talking about their experience. They're able to rate us now and it's not a five-star thing. Um, yeah. So now we need to talk to our, our legal department and the legal department, <laughs> they're not saying, you know, of course, you know, God is real because he's answering our prayers more than he's answering anybody else's. Of course, we've got these promises by him that are being fulfilled filled left and right. And it's so dumb for you to question because this person was raised from the dead. Right. And we know that for sure. Why would you question us? That's not what's happening. No. The legal department is, is saying, well, how do you even know that you know that there is such a thing as knowing? Hmm. Yep. <laughs> it's like, if you had the hard evidence, then the case would be closed. Story would be over. And we could all go back to Sunday services, right? But exactly what you said, that's not what is happening. And that's not what apologetics does. There was no adult in the room. Nope. It's just us. There were just two baby monitors pointed at each other. Oh, that's hurt. That hurts. I don't know why, but that like that struck a chord. Yeah. In one of your recent videos, you took the arguments that you're used to and kind of put them all in one video because a certain person came in and they wrote a letter that was just so bad that it hit each one of those things, you know? <laughs> I don't want to base anything off that stupid letter or that individual. I would rather go off your experience and say, here are the things that bubble up to the top constantly. Mm -hmm. That I'm here are the moles that I've had that have popped up so often that not only do they have a concussion from how many times I've whacked them, but I know their names and how many kids they have, where they live <laughs> and um, what their goals are, right? Uh, we're friends. So what are some of the most like ridiculous, fallacious things that you're used to having to speak against? Yeah. Oof. How long have you got? So, um, the first one that gets me every time is the, and it's, and it's going to sound, uh, like everyone thinks they know what an ad hominem is, right? Like, oh, you called me a name. It's an ad hom argument. And no, that's not the case, right? Like if somebody calls you a, a name or is bullying you while you're arguing, that's, that's, they're just bad at what they do. Like that's just, that's not part of the argument itself. Um, 
An ad hom specifically is when you use a characteristic that you dislike or you think is discrediting about someone else to discredit an entirely different argument, right? So, for example, I would say um, Brady can't be right about which Star Trek is best because Brady wears a hat. And everybody knows that people who wear hats are not authorities when it comes to Star Trek. Um, so like that would be an ad hom. I mean, it's a really good, it's a good mm-hmm. point. I think that you're, I think that you're right. I don't, I'm not credible. I don't, I should stop wearing this fucking <laughs> hat. Shit. Uh, I mean, it worked. It worked. It, it worked. And it's, that's the thing. If you don't works. know that that's what's happening or if it's not as obvious and as blatantly different, then you will fall for this, right? Or you will allow someone else to lead you down that path. And you will start thinking about somebody in a way based on an ad hom argument about them that isn't accurate and shouldn't even be in, in the conversation. So a, a version of this that directly relates to deconstructing is all the time what happens is I will tell people about my very weird and kind of culty upbringing and people even within my own family go, oh, that's why you are an atheist. And everything that you say, even if it's about scientific literacy or if it's about real problems within the church, anything can be dismissed because what we're focusing on is the fact that you were traumatized by a weird culty version of Christianity and clearly you're just mad and hurt about it. And so nothing else you say matters in any arena that even touches it. And honestly, that is the biggest one to get over because for a long time, I believed that. And I wouldn't talk about my experience because I was thinking, well, my experience was uniquely bad. And I probably am just kind of like holding on to a lot of anger and resentment. And probably that's what's happening. So I'm just going to shut up. And I bought that for a while until I realized, oh, wait, there is a word for what they're doing here. And it's a fallacy. There's a parallel that makes this very personal to me that I've discovered through a lot of self-reflection and therapy and growing. That is, I grew up in a home with more than one person showing narcissistic symptoms Mm. and not being able to accept fault. I realized that the same logic that is needed to defend Bible God, and I said, I personally don't believe in God, but I want to I want to show respect to our listeners who believe in God that isn't reflected by the personality of the Bible, et cetera. So, so bear with us. This isn't just about atheists wanting to kill any idea of God or any mm-hmm. theistic belief. This is about getting people outside of a harmful belief system. But the reflection and the epiphany that I had was understanding that the same logic that is used in apologetics is the same logic my family would use to always defend themselves and to come from a place of defense always. Mm -hmm. There's a complex PTSD red flags that were going off (laughs) whenever I would listen to people and listen, uh, how would people use the Bible within fundamentalism to get their own way and act like their interpretation is obvious and blah, 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 blah. There's a gaslighting that comes along with it. Um, I got from my family, parents, Understanding what you're saying is what helped me not only deconstruct out of fundamentalism, but also to deconstruct my childhood and to deconstruct my own yeah. autonomy and ability, my ability to know what's real and what isn't. Yes, 100%. Yes, um, I deeply resonate with that. And I think it, it plays into each other, right? The, the minute that you start realizing, oh, these are the red flags I need to watch out for to survive this, this narcissistic parent or, or this, this relationship that is abusive or gaslighting. And you start training yourself in that arena. And then you bring those lessons that you've learned into a religious arena and you start seeing all the same red flags pop up for you that you've trained yourself yes. to look for. So it just, it just combines in, in this way that really, to me, truly healing from an abusive past or truly finding solace after experiencing trauma or PTSD at the hands of, you know, unstable people 
really, I don't think you can pull it apart from fundamentalism. I think you would have to leave both if you were truly understanding your own worth and why it was wrong to have experienced that in the first place, you know? Another thing I want to pull in is boundaries. We need to make boundaries with our beliefs. Um, when we were graced with God, we kind of released all of that and we were taught not to have any boundaries and allowed ourselves to do anything. We would get swept away into it. That wasn't healthy. That wasn't helpful. For a lot of us who came from unstable backgrounds, we needed stability. And I know that there was... How do I say this? The funny thing about coming out and deconstructing is you're also having to deal with progressive Christianity's prejudices towards fundamentalism. Is that mm-hmm. fair to say from your Absolutely. experience? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And that was confusing too, because that was also being taught as like obvious and something that I should be seeing. Mm-hmm. One thing that I was attracted to was stability and consistency. And a lot of times that was kind of blamed on, well, that was because of your past. It's because of how unstable your background was. I got to thinking, I'm like, that's just kind of normal though. Yeah. If we're talking about a product, if we're talking about something that we're all advertising and say how wonderful it is, and there's no real way of like rating it or letting people have accountability of what's being said, would there be a weird person that would come forward and say, hey, what if this isn't actually doing what says that it's doing? What if we should do something about that? Would I think that that person's weird? And I thought, I'm like, no, I wouldn't. I would think that they're Mm -hmm. normal and probably are on the right path towards something that can bring a lot of healing and a lot of change for the future. Yeah, I like that analogy. I think that that makes a lot of sense. So um, the, the thing for me kind of tying into that there's there are so many areas where oh you have years and years of expertise in this thing you have experienced this you must really know what you're talking about right like let's sit down and listen to this person who has known all of this for a very long time when it comes to trauma when it comes to healing from that trauma it feels like it's the opposite and the second that i for example would say hey this is an abusive tactic that this church is using. Suddenly it's not, oh, V knows what abuse is because V had to deal with it for so long and has this intimate awareness of what it is and how it works and how to get out of it. It's, oh, V was abused for so long. So clearly they don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) Right. This is a mind trip. Yeah. Um, Ad Hahnemann, big one. That's uh, that comes up very often. Which ones off the top of your head kind of pop up? There's one. Let's see if I can find a way to phrase this because it's kind of like shifting the burden of proof, but in a more subtle way, because you can always tell when someone's doing it, obviously, like there is a unicorn in my backyard. No, there's not. Well, you have to prove that there's not a unicorn in my back. Like, like, of course, you're going to call that out. It's like, well, that's that's not how that works. <laughs> and the person who's making the claim is the one who needs to back that claim up with evidence in order to be convincing. But a lot of apologists and a lot of apologetics kind of use that, in my experience, as a way to foist in assumptions that don't need to be there. So, for example, a uh, Kalam cosmological argument Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Doesn't get us to a God in any way, shape or form. But a lot of apologists like to use it as that first step into something created the universe. Now, that second premise, the universe began to exist, for example, if you were to say, well, I'm not convinced of that (laughs) because we have these competing theories based in science and observation that make us think maybe it didn't. The assumption there is that then you have to prove that the universe didn't start to exist until like, or else we are taking this, this is accurate, this is right, we're moving on. So when you're building an argument in apologetics, uh, syllogisms, when you're building premise, 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 conclusion, it can be, it can be valid and it can be sound. So if it's valid, that means that like all of the premises lead obviously to the conclusion. But if it's not sound, that means that it's not actually accurate to reality right? That's where all of this shifting the burden of proof comes in is in these premises where they're smuggling in these claims that they are just going to pretend is the way that that's the way things are. And if you raise an objection to it, then like you said before, you have to have all your ducks in a row. You have to know all about cosmology, all about science, all about everything in order to refute that premise or else we're just taking this premise, moving on forward. So when you're dealing with an apologetic that has various premises, make sure you're looking at every single one 
of those and seeing is there some are there assumptions being made here? Is there a shifting of the burden of proof? If you raise a flag and be like, hey, I'm not convinced of that. What's the response? Is the response, oh, yeah, well, why? Give me all of the reasons why it's not convincing. I remember when I was a kid, my brother, my brother was an asshole bully, but he a lot of times would be like, um, hey, do, do your friends know you're gay? And so it was like, as a kid, you know, it'd be like, oh, I'm not gay. <laughs> well, I, I was, I am. But, you know, just hold yeah. your, uh, suspend your disbelief for one moment during the story, listeners. Thank you. <laughs> but that thing, you know, it's built into the assumption that I see so often in my life too, coming from family and other people who would do that same thing and come at you with an accusation that's built into something. And then you're finding yourself yourself having to defend all of these other things and then you you're, you're getting worn out it reminds me so much of trump bullshit of how he has to always defend himself so he's just going to throw out all this shit and see whatever lands on the wall and sticks and go with that but then the other things we're just supposed to forget it and it's like no no no, no that's not how this works mm-hmm. so so far we've touched ad hominem and i wanted to also tell the listeners i plan on uh i made a graphic uh a, a while ago that has seven common logic flaws that are used against people who are questioning their faith. I plan on updating that, putting those together, and then releasing a new one that I'll share on social media. But so far, we've got um, ad hominem, where it becomes about the person who's who's making argument, not about the argument itself. Um, A big one that I would see is total depravity. Oh, your Mm -hmm. eyes are blind to the gospel. In 2 Corinthians, it says, the glory of God is blind in the eyes of those who are falling blah, blah, get, get out of here the whole I'm the only one who can see it but you can't that is straight from like the emperor's new groove give me a break I'm just joking emperor's new clothes <laughs> they're all saying that they're seeing it but we've all been to their prayer services we know how much they struggle with the faith because we did it and you know how much they're doubting themselves and have to normalize it and yep. again none of these arguments are premise the bible says God answers prayers he answered my prayers. I know that God is real. That's not a consistent, distinctive premise that's being used. This is, well, if you go back to what Aristotle says about uh, the shadows in the cave, that we could really figure out the original Latin. Get out of here. Go home. Ad hominem and uh, shifting the burden <laughs> of proof. That that whole of, well, you can't, you can't prove that God isn't real. Also, that shoving. It is, shoving yeah, absolutely. The premise, shoving, uh, moving, it's kind of like moving the goalposts in a way, isn't it? Yeah. So moving the goalposts is very specifically, oh, well, a good example is anything relating to the God of the gaps. Can you define that too? Oh, well, we don't know where lightning comes from. Therefore, God exists and God makes lightning. So God of the gaps is just saying the things we haven't figured out or discovered yet, we're just going to put a mystical force behind it until we figure it out. (laughs) Exactly. Anything that science can't explain is obviously God. Um, And the problem is that the more science learns and the more science helps us become aware of our world, the the smaller and smaller that gap becomes. And that's where the shift in the goalposts come in, because it used to be, well, we know that God created like God is real because, you know, God brings us the lightning and the rain. And then we figured out how lightning and rain happened. And okay, well, that's not God. Obviously, we know how that happens. But God is the reason we have electricity. like. It just keeps going. So historically, there's an example of moving the goalpost. I mean, originally the early church was saying, no, this is what really happened. Uh, we know this for sure. And now it's like, if we keep on moving it to, to today, it's like, oh, the parts that are obvious to believe, yeah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Some parts are literal, other parts aren't. What really matters is it tries to become like a figurative thing, but that's not what it's really said. And that's not what it's taking responsibility right. for whenever those changes happen. Yeah. I think of the really basic ones of does the universe or the solar system go around, not the solar system, what we call it then? Is it around the earth? Is Are we the middle of the universe? Whereas the sun, blah, 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 whenever that shift happened, they literally killed scientists. Like the church murdered yes. people who were teaching against that. And then now we pretend that it was like, oh, well, no, we believe that the whole time. Fundamentalism. Oh yeah, clearly. Fundamentalism <laughs> didn't come until the 1960s and nobody really took the Bible literally until then, and they were all cool. No, no, no. That's not that's not the situation. 
it's always been fundamentalism. We're just talking to a different species that's come from the same lineage of monsters. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, shifting the burden of proof, uh, moving the goalposts, a lot of movement, a lot of shifty movement going on here. Um, another big one is not so much a fallacy in, in the classical sense, um, but it is one that I have frequently found the most frustrating about apologetics. Taking a philosophical argument to prove a conclusion and maybe it gets there, right? Maybe you have found exactly the right combination of words to get us to a conclusion, hypothetically. If that conclusion or any of the steps used to get there have been disproven by actual science, then that philosophical argument, no matter how valid it is, is still wrong. And there's this concept that, well, if I can prove it with philosophy, then that's just as good as you proving it with science. And that's not how we weight things. And a really good example of this is the concept of um, William Lane Craig and Alvin Plantinga have this concept where it's the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And you have certain beliefs that are just so basic and so integral to your existence that they don't need an explanation. They just are. And one of those things is the inner witness of the Holy Spirit the divine connection to God. And that's just a properly basic belief. That's just something that you know, because you know it, you should never question those things that you know, just because you know them. And philosophically, the way that they phrase things makes it kind of convincing until you realize that we've already taken apart the human brain in neuroscience and neurobiology and neurochemistry and realized that we operate our brains on two different wavelengths. We've got type one thinking and type two thinking. And type one thinking is survival mode. It's I'm reacting to everything as if it were a threat. I'm going to make assumptions about things, even if they might not be statistically accurate, because it's better to be safe than sorry. And type two thinking is that higher kind of rational brain that comes in and kicks in when you're in a safe environment, when you're a little bit more involved and you're like, okay, well, what is the real, like there's the instinctual, the rational in terms of like, well, this makes sense. Obviously it's this thing. Type two thinking comes in and says, well, how accurate is that? Let's do some research. Let's talk to some people. Let's think about this. All that properly basic beliefs are, is that type one thinking. So we understand what those properly basic beliefs are. And we also understand why it can be bad to rely on them. And so this argument that, oh, we just know things because we know things and that's great and we should just go with it is being directly explained and contradicted by neuroscience. When somebody comes to me with a philosophical argument and is like, this is the, this is the truth because I can get here with words and wordplay. Cool. That's fun. Good for you. Does it conflict with actual science? If it does, I'm sorry, you're, you're out of luck. You've lost the game. While you were saying that, it hit me of how important your work is because what reality is asking deconstructioners to do is to come out of a situation <laughs> as a wounded, often traumatized person and to then operate at this higher level that comes from a place of stability that they haven't found yet because the rug was just pulled from underneath them. That's such a frustrating thing, but it shows the importance of what you're doing that you as somebody who's kind of gone mm -hmm. through a lot of these can now mama bird those into baby deconstruction in his mouth and, and can say, I have already chewed on the, God, I, I really should change this <laughs> illustration, but I'm going with it. I've already chewed on this a lot. Mm -hmm. I know that this is going to help you. It's going to feel weird, but... And then that bird is able to grow up and then get the nutrients that it needs to be able to fly away on the nest on its own. But that's what you're providing for people. And what we're able to do with social media is kind of sneak around the side where we were all kind of pushed out and told to be quiet. But now we're able to meet up and then find other people and say, hey, you are in this weird mental escape room. Um, I'm not going to give you the answers or the codes, but here are all the ways that you could, you know, find the answers. Yeah. I want to say thank you for what you're doing and just the passion that you put behind it, because 
damn, even from a neurological standpoint, that's so fucking important. Thank you. I I love the way you put that, even though you you, you picked an interesting <laughs> metaphor and just went with it. And I appreciate that about you. Um, but no, exactly. And I think I think with the format of Twitter, which is my other love another bird Mm. yeah there you go it to the 280 characters max like what are you going to get in there that is new that is helpful to people that condenses these complicated Mm. topics into their core components so yeah it's it's fun (sighs) what's the next fallacy you got so one that is pervasive is circular reasoning Mm. and the reason It's so pervasive and it's so subtle so much of the time. If you were to listen to somebody doing a circular argument, that's super basic, super simple. God is, uh, God is, uh, you know, Yahweh is God. Why is Yahweh God? Because the Bible says so. Why does, what does the Bible, like, how do I I say? The one that I've seen and that I've experienced a lot is I believe the Bible. Well, why? Well, because the Bible says that the Bible is God's word. How do you know that it's God's word? Well, the Bible says it is. And I trust you because it says. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Thank you for saving me there. I didn't even have to shed my blood. (laughs) (laughs) The concept of a circular argument there is essentially X premise is true. Mm -hmm. How do you know? Because Y? Well, how do you know? Because X. And so it was just this little, little, nice little circle. And it can get really intimidating at a larger scale, especially with these apologists who utilize that circular reasoning in a way that is really insidious. So an example for this one would be the modal ontological argument. Essentially what that says when it gets broken down into its very essence is, let's see if I can summarize this very complicated thing here. God exists in this universe because God must exist in all universes because God is God. And why is God God? Because God exists in all universes, which means that God exists in this universe. And it's just this this circle of, well, you are just defining this character into being and using that definition that you just came up with for the sake of this argument to make your argument in the first place. The way that it is presented is very complicated. And honestly, for a while, it stumped me. I was like, I don't know if I can respond to this one. I mean, I'm not convinced by it, but I can't clearly see where, it, where it's going wrong and why I disagree with it. So my partner and I actually sat down for like 24 straight hours and just graphed it. And we're listening to other people's thoughts on it and like talking through it and like breaking it apart and focusing on each element. And it took a lot of effort. And when we finally got to that ending point, we realized this is just a circular argument. There is nothing here except for a definition that you are saying must be true because it is true in the definition. And honestly, it lost all its teeth. It happens off the Bible because the Bible acts as the grounds that we're supposed to all be walking on. It acts as if that's the universe that we're all built in, especially if we're brought up into it, that indoctrination is from childhood where we're building up our understanding of just how the universe works. If that's being told to us, well, yeah, this is how the universe works. And we're going to take that literally. And that's going to become just as, well, we can just state that as obvious as gravity, right? Because everybody who's brought up at this, no, that's not, it's not that operates. How does that work in a domestic world? I see a lot of times with family who says, well, because I said so, well, because I'm your, because I'm your parent and the Bible says to do this. So Mm -hmm. it creates circular reasoning for other many narcissists personalities to kind of build their own reign. We have to learn how to get into that circle and say, eh, this circle needs to be broken. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's stop that. Yeah. And it's, again, like, I love this through line of mental health and and stopping of trauma and, and abuse because the mindset that is cultivated in fundamentalist congregations is one of, well, I need to accept this because it says so. Why do I need to accept it? Because it said so. They get caught in that circular reasoning and that just becomes the way that they reason. And so when someone inputs a new point in that circle, because I say so, Mm. oh, okay, because I say so, why should I care? Because they say so. So it becomes really difficult for victims of abuse or, or bad situations to get out because the only kind of logic 
that they've been taught, that they've been indoctrinated with, is one that is self-perpetuating and really keeps them open to being taken advantage of. And trauma creates cycles. Why do you treat people that way? Because I was treated that Mm -hmm. way. Why do you treat others that way? Because I was treated that way. That becomes a circular thing as well. And we have to break that cycle. Uh, Why do you treat your children badly? Because I was treated badly. Even within our families, we have to be one, have the awareness to see that cycle and then to find ways to break it uh, by being ourselves and to say, no, I'm not going to operate from that first part of our brain. We're going to operate from a bigger, more objective one that is going to take into account our kids' future as well. So damn, yeah, so much parallel there. I fucking love it. Yeah. Confirmation bias is a big one that I notice, And that's just kind of, we work from our own experiences. Apologists think that they can prove that the universe has to be created by God. That automatically that means that everything in their Bible and mm-hmm. their interpretation of the Bible is suddenly correct. And that they're, yep. you know, and it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're conflating a whole lot there. Right. Um, yes. Speak to that sort of conflation. Yeah. 100%. That is really like next level where it's not just you're looking at the argument itself and being like, all right, does this make sense? Is this committing any fallacies on its own? And you're looking at it in the broader context, understanding who is hearing it and what they are hearing and where that confirmation bias comes into play. So again, our friend, the Kalam, everything that began to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Most Christians In my experience, and I know certainly for me, when they hear that, that's all they need to hear because in their head, they have already jumped from cause to creator, to my version of the creator, to my version that is current to my church of that creator. So they've jumped like five steps in that one moment. And then they go, yes, clearly the Quran proves Christianity. No, it doesn't. It doesn't even prove a God in the first place. But even if we were to grant that it did, even if we were like, okay, fine, the the Kalam cosmological argument, I'm going to go so far as to say it not only proves a creator, it proves a God. Now, how do you get that to your God? And I have yet to find a single person who is able to actually put aside that confirmation bias and get to a specific version of God using that jumping off point. William Lane Craig tries. He does. He tries tacking on a whole bunch of attributes to that cause that will get him a little inch closer to it, um, but it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a myriad of reasons. Point taken. If, if you are hearing an apologetic and a lot of people are like really convinced by it, and you're like, why are they so convinced by this very clearly subpar argument? It's because they are coming at it from a completely different mindset where they have already filled in all of the gaps in their head Mm -hmm. and they have already jumped to a conclusion that is being implied, but not outrightly stated. All while singing how distinctive their God is and not able to show anything distinctive whatsoever. Mm -hmm. All that conflation gets a Trojan horse of homophobia, of transphobia, of misogyny, of slavery apologetics, of all of just this fucking bullshit that has plagued progression, has plagued humanity, and also the entire world because of how careless we are. It's plagued so much and... Our culture needs to step back and learn this shit so we can find better, more helpful, less harmful shit to deal with, right? Ah, but Brady, they're not true Christians. Oh, I know this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You 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 let us right into that. That was well, beautiful. The, I was a I was a Calvinist. So we had this oh. built in. This is built into Calvinism. Um, and it, it's called no true Scotsman fallacy. It's this idea of, oh, well, you must, well, you left Christianity. Well, you must not have been a real Christian. It's this thing of, well, because you left, you didn't, you weren't real the, this whole time. We're not responsible for you. You're just, we're going to put you in this other category. As a Calvinist, we had what was called perseverance of the saints. And that was basically saying, if you persevere until the end, well, yeah, that means you are a saint. But if you didn't, well, 
you didn't lose your salvation. You never had it because those who are Christians yep. are the ones who are saved and the ones who are saved are the ones who persevere. So if you didn't persevere, that's because you weren't actually saved. So it's like this other dumb thing of like, you know, they say, were you saved or always saved, not saved? Can you lose your salvation? But it's all the exact same argument because we're, we're not making a documentary. We're just living real life. Um, and you can yeah. afterwards look back and say, oh, this is what happened. But in the theme, we're still living it. And it's all you know, Schrodinger's future of whether or not it's really going to happen or not. So yeah, you can't, well, I'm, it's all the same. My, my question specifically for perseverance of the saints is how on earth does that square with free will or does it not at all? Like you would have to give up your idea of free will. It's all just starting. It's making the same argument, but starting at a different block. So with Calvinism, we would say the only way that we were able to believe is because it was given to us by grace to believe. Because God took off those blinders, we were able to see the gospel. So we still try to like our... the. Are uh, there? <laughs> they want to start on God's grace to really emphasize that and to center that, and then all the theology comes off of that. But it's all saying the same mm. things, but coming yeah. at it in a different way of understanding: Are we living it, or are we making a documentary about what happens? Are we making declarative statements? Are we prescriptive, descriptive? It all doesn't matter because none of it is showing up, and none of it is real. But what No True Scotsman does then is. If you left the faith, then you are now no longer part of, you've lost your voice. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a form of shunning, I think, for a lot of people. I've had many people say, well, V, clearly you never believed or never loved God or never cared. And I think about myself in the middle of the night, wandering campus, just sobbing, trying to find God again and just feeling like, someone died, you know, and, and this concept of, oh, you're just going to look at me because of the way I am now and negate that. No, I didn't actually have a relationship with God because it didn't exist. But that experience on my end was real. And to say that it wasn't is, is a form of saying, well, you were never one of us, go away, shut up. Um, but a, a larger problem with no true Scotsman and this conversation that we're having is the, the number of Christians that are granting cover to this toxic group because they're all using the same word and they're saying, well, they're not actually Christians. So they don't speak for us and we're not responsible for them. And you can't lump us together. And don't you pull us into that shit. We're going to claim the term and we're going to use it how we want to, which might not be terribly, but you're providing cover for that word. And you're providing cover for everyone else who is using that word in a horrible, horrible, hurtful way by saying, oh, well, they're not really Christians. So you can't have, we don't have anything to do with them, right? It's this differentiation that, that needs to stop happening <laughs> because what we need to be able to do is rely on the Christians who disagree with their brethren to reach out and be like, hey guys, here's what you're doing wrong. Let's, let's show you the way here as opposed to just saying, oh, well, pfft, no, we don't, we don't care about them. They're just, they're just not even like us. It's been my experience that progressive Christianity conditions people to see themselves as Jesus and to see fundamentalism as the Bible's version of Pharisees. I, I don't like using that word of the, because yeah. it's not respectful to Jewish uh, Judaism, because. how th the New Testament depicts them. And then fundamentalism, mm -hmm. they yeah. see, they look at progressive Christianity as, as that they're the Jesuses and that the progressive Christians are the Pharisees and that their need to change them. They don't like each other because of, well, one takes our Bible too literally and the other ones, well, we don't take it literally enough. But 
it's not a story of Jesus yeah. calling out the quote unquote Pharisees. What's actually happened is they've both just kind of decided to live right next to each other and to not interact. And then to whenever it's time to make Christianity look good, hey, hey, hey come on over. We need some people to join a picture. Uh, but then when it's time to talk about things, 99% of Christians don't think that 99% of Christians mm-hmm. are actually Christians. <laughs> And it's like they they don't believe each other at all. Yep. And why should we believe any of them? Nothing is distinctive again, right? Right. And it's motivated by external things, I would imagine. So on the one hand, fundamentalists love to hate on progressive Christians, right? They are a punching bag more than atheists are for a lot of a lot of people. But the second that they need to prove that they are modern and cool and fun. Oh, well, maybe it's not so bad anymore, right? We need to maintain some power and some image here. And it's the same the other way around. I think progressive Christians, I think a lot of individual progressive Christians that I know are actually trying to help. But I think that in general, progressive Christianity really likes the power and the privilege of being Christian. And it's not, they're not the ones who are going after it and getting it. The people who are going after and getting and solidifying Christian supremacy in the U.S. are the the far right whack jobs. And so they're not going to come too hard at them, right? It's going to be like, oh, well, we don't agree with it, but like, maybe they can just do their thing. And then we get the residual benefits of being Christians in a Christian, quote unquote, country. They both think that they're each other's embarrassing drunk uncle. <laughs> co- I like that. Yeah. You're right. It's a codependent relationship that kind of just leeches off of mm-hmm. the rest of the universe, if you ask me, but that's a whole other story. Um, anyway, moving on. So <laughs> we've touched on a lot of these really big ones. Uh, we've hit ad hominem of when it's about the person and not about the arguments, uh, shifting the burden of proof, trying to shove things into the premise. We've talked about confirmation bias of this is all I've really grown up with, so I'm going to put things into this box. There's, there was something you said in one of your videos recently. Um, there was an individual who wrote and they basically, how you characterized it, I feel summed it up perfectly. I don't understand a science thing. You can't explain it, so I must be right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, it's uh, another thing that you said is not believing in God or, or atheism um, or, or, or deconstructing away from a fundamentalism. God, it is not a one to one comparison to Christianity. No. Um, not believing in God is the answer to one question. Do you believe in God? No. Um, and in Christianity is this whole other conflated book of claims and blah, 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 blah. Right. So confirmation bias is interesting too, because we try to reapply the structure that we're used to. Oh, well, I believe all these books at face value. Sure. Oh, well, you must believe this science book all at face value. Yep. Yep. Why is that bonkers? How are those different? Yeah. It's something that is so, so familiar to me at this point where the assumption is that you have to be thinking in terms of servitude and in terms of obedience and in terms of ownership. And these concepts are so baked in, not only to Christianity, but in our culture at large, that when you say, I'm an atheist, the first thoughts are, well, who do you obey? You know, well, who's telling you what to do? <laughs> uh, like, them. what ownership is, is like, what, how does ownership come into play here? Who, do, who are you in charge of now? And who's in charge of you? And it's none of that, right? It's really just the answer to a single question. A, a better comparison would be secular humanism, which is a, a, a slew of tenets, right? And, and this concept of actually having a worldview and values kind of baked in. But even then, there's no book, there's no pastor, there's no priest, there's no concept of an authority figure outside of just, hey, let's have a conversation and see what we can come up with and then discuss that general consensus. And just that concept is so foreign to people that a lot of the time when you say you're an atheist or when you say you're a secular humanist, the assumption is, well, okay, what book is your Bible then? Looking from a political point of view, it's kind of the difference of saying, this is what our founding fathers or what we say the founding fathers <laughs> uh, believed and said, blah, 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 blah. We need to keep replicating this and preserve it in all ways. Or the other way is to say, those laws 
were helpful and good for that time. Now let's have laws and things that are helpful for our time. And there's another way of saying, hey, well, our founding fathers also talked about amendments. So whenever we do amends, we actually are honoring their wishes, right? Those two different mindsets are saying two different things. One is saying, I have the capital T truth. And the other one says, I look at life different. I look at my environment as a theme for me to adapt to and for us to make the best out of while we're here. So let's progress it. Two different mindsets and you can't apply one thing of strict rules onto the other. That needs to shatter our biases. We can see beyond that. Right. Um, some other fallacies that we've touched on was like appeal to faith. That's like a, that's one that comes up a lot of like, well, you just have to, you have to believe it to see it. It's kind of the code, right? Um, of well, that's the whole thing about God. Mm-hmm. We've moralized mm-hmm. it. Even like secular culture, like in Disney movies and stuff, is a lot of ways have just said like it is good to have faith. Okay, but faith in what? What makes faith good or not? Just that you believe in something deeply. That's right, not helpful right. right now today because Trump and the misinformation. Um, can you speak to that a little bit of appeal to faith and how? that operates yeah appeal to faith is yeah you are so right it's baked into the culture to the point where it almost feels silly to bring it up like of course believing in something with all your heart is a good thing right like that's just considered to be something that is a moral thing to do and to doubt is a bad thing and to ask too many questions is bad and to reserve judgment is bad So like there is this really intense kind of black and white to it and I think that's why I like I like Star Trek so much because it actually turns that on its head a lot of the time. And it becomes a conversation of, okay, well, this is how it seems and this is what we believe, but how is it actually? And so honestly, like the fact that we have certain elements of our culture that are moving in that direction consistently, even like modern retellings of these things um, is very hopeful to me because hopefully what will happen is we'll be able to move the culture away from that first So that saying things like, well, I just believe it with all my heart doesn't automatically come with, oh, well, then I have to respect it, you know, because you don't. Because you're conflating also so many other things within that too. You know, it's like we mentioned before, it's like a Trojan horse of all this other things. Mm -hmm. Another one, a questionable cause. It's just kind of this, um, you know, well, how do you know there's, well, look at the trees. Well, because these things are here and I can't really, you know, because this happens and it kind of goes back to God of the gaps in some ways, right? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. The questionable cause and God of the gaps, I think, are interlinked very, very closely. Um, The only areas where I would say a questionable cause extends beyond that is areas outside of science and also not just Christians either. Right. Like questionable cause is kind of that type one thinking we were talking about earlier, kind of what could be the cause of this thing. And I need to determine what that is right now, whether or not it's accurate, because I need to protect myself from it. So it really is that kind of baseline thinking that does help us survive in some instances because it makes us overcautious. But at the same time, when you apply that type two thinking and you start looking at things rationally, the questionable cause does start to disintegrate a little bit. Type two thinking also gives us the opportunity of saying, what is it that I'm just trusting? What is it that I'm putting to faith? Mm-hmm. And what is the value of that? Remember, we've been talking about observation. One of the first things is self-awareness. Can I observe why I'm putting my faith in that thing? Is it doing a whole bunch of the things that it says it's doing? No. Well, then observe something else and see if that is keeping up to what it says that it's going to do. Like, yeah. well, how do you know if it's a false advertisement? Well, you start off by what it's saying and you ask yourself, is it doing it? Is it not no, now let's investigate why it's Mm -hmm. continuing to go that way, right? Or is it designed in such a way that you will never be able to tell if it's doing it right? And so you can just continue to say, this thing is working its magic, but there's no way to tell if it's actually doing the thing or not. That's a great point. And that's a wonderful way to end because, you know, we've been bringing this back to some mental health and to like relationships. I think to... 
back then I thought I was worthy of not having a two-sided relationship. And so I was okay with mm-hmm. me doing all of this servitude, all this dedication, and then expecting, well, he'll pay me back later whenever I'm dead. And to realize that's not a, that's not a healthy relationship. I'm not, I'm not nope. marrying one in, if that was in my personal life, if that was in my belief life, I need to draw boundaries. That's a red flag. And when I realized all of those red flags of just like, yeah, I believed I was in a relationship. That's what fundamentalism is based on, right? It's a relationship, not a religion. But whenever I'm the only one showing up in that that relationship and I can't Mm -hmm. point to anything distinctive that he's bringing to it, it's time to break up. Yeah. Absolutely. It's also time to get going. Um, (laughs) um, Thank you so much, V, for having this conversation and just letting us learn from your Jedi wisdom. Um, (laughs) And, well, no, Star Trek and fuck Star Wars. Uh, Vulcan. I prefer Vulcan. We're good. Infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Uh, But anyway, I love everything you're doing and I appreciate the hell out of what you've helped us with today. So thank you. Absolutely. It was wonderful getting to talk with you today. Oh, thanks. Um, I end all the episodes with a little saying, and that is, if you don't go to church, a Sunday is just a second Saturday. See you next episode. This has been an episode of the Life After podcast. Find us on Facebook for our secret online community. Find our merch on TeePublic, monthly contributions on Patreon, and don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. Used to hate myself, congratulations, you played yourself out of mental health and living in self. Speak for yourself, your marriage not a testimony. Don't believe the church is a bribe, but she owe me alimony. I'm a pony up and stick a feather in your ceremony. Wearing weddings out, I call it Yankee Doodle matrimony. And I'm only getting started, my tongue is fire. Fighting gaslighting leaders like your ways are not higher. I don't need a choir to bring down the entire empire. You threw the gasoline. I'm just spitting matches through the wire. I'm just trying to break them free, make them see the refrains and mental chains of slavery. I disagree with any preacher teaching I own defeat. I repeat, I don't need a church to walk in victory. I'm complete. And everybody sing, and everybody sing. Please, pull some strings for me. Everybody sing, and everybody sing. Go, 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 go.